Yes, it actually helps with the algorithms if you give this video a thumbs up, if you leave a comment. All right, the question is this, what is it like to be autistic? So we're talking to people who are not autistic, but I'm assuming that most of the people watching this video are autistic. So as we go through these eight points, you can let us know. If you identify with these, maybe we've left several out, and I know there's far more than eight, so there's something you may want to add to the list, and you can do that in the comments section. But uh, the problem is, when you're trying to explain to non-autistic people, that is to say to people who are neurotypical, what it is like to be autistic. Some people call it Asperger's syndrome, some people call it high-functioning autism, which is primarily what we're talking about. They don't have a point of reference, and because of that, they really can't understand where we're coming from. So uh, what they will do is they will go to their closest point of reference. For example, we will say, number one, that uh, we have a real challenge with small talk. I don't know about you, but I have a real problem with that. But the average neurotypical person makes small talk very easily. It's very natural for them. I mean, literally, they're hardwired to do that. So they don't get it. So they've got to come up with some point point of reference that would come the closest to what it is we're talking about. So I kind of help them along with that. And uh, the favorite example, the favorite analogy that I use is I'll ask them, you know, have you ever uh, been called upon to make a public speech? And some of them have, you know, As some of them do it all the time. School teachers, you know, they're in front of a crowd of people all the time. They uh, frequently, and so they don't have a real problem getting in front of public, but if you get them in front of adults instead of children that they're accustomed to, they may get really nervous. Uh, but most people, they they have no no uh, experience public speaking, and so when suddenly they're called upon to talk to a large group of people, they get nervous, they have anxiety, they get stressed out sometimes. Uh, I've heard of people running for office and when it came time to engage in debate, I mean, they literally broke down. They could not do it. That's kind of an extreme case, but that's what it's like to make small talk. So uh, what happens to me, and I think this may happen to you, is I have fairly organized, uh, a fairly organized thinking process. Uh, I know that because, well, when I do these videos, I always create an outline and I do that, you know, almost every day of the week. So I'm thinking in terms of organization. When I had my business, you know, you have to be organized. You have to think in terms of marketing and how much you spend on direct mail and on advertising and what the return of investment will be, you know, the ROI. So you're thinking in very organized, linear terms until, until you're called upon to make some small talk. What is it about that? It, well, uh, you know, to a neurotypical person, it's like being called upon suddenly to make a public speech, and your brain just scrambles. So that's what happens to my mind is somebody says hello. I mean, that's all it takes. Somebody say hi, wave to you, comes up to you, starts talking just out of nowhere, and my brain starts to scramble, particularly if I don't expect it. And my words come out scrambled, and the people look at me like I'm kind of weird. And I guess, you know, in a sense, I am kind of weird. It's kind of like I'm being called upon to speak to a crowd of 10,000 people, talking to one person. So I tell people that so they will understand what it is like. And they still think I'm weird, but that's all right. So small talk is number one. We have this thing, or at least I have this thing. You could tell me if you have it too, where my brain just goes into scramble mode, and so my words go into scramble mode. And a lot of times I try to speak, and the words just don't come out. And it sounds very uh, strange, very odd when I try to talk, and, you know, some noise comes out, but it's just not normal. So people think, well, this guy has a problem. He's abnormal. So what's it like to be an Aspie, or what's it like to be autistic? Well, we have a real challenge with social interaction, and small talk is a subset of that. And it's difficult. It's challenging. Yeah, I'm getting better at it. I'm thinking by the time I'm 80 or 90 years old, I'll have this down pat. Number two is we have what uh, I call pathological altruism. I, or maybe you call it pathological empathy. I don't believe those are 
I don't believe those are scientific terms, um, but basically pathology means we can't help it. We're hardwired to be this way. And altruism, well, it means altruism. It means empathy, that we care about people, that we are sensitive. And we don't come across that way because, well, we have this deficit in socializing, so it seems like we don't care. It seems like we are aloof, that we're disconnected. And in some ways we are, well, a lot of ways we are disconnected, but still we care. But people don't pick up on that. They think we don't care. But uh, at least in my experience, very altruistic, have high ideals, have high standards, almost too high. Somebody, uh, I read one time that uh, some woman said the best advice her father ever gave her when she was growing up was to keep her head out of the clouds. And I had to stop and think about that. What does it mean to keep your head out of the clouds? It means, as I understood it, don't be so altruistic. You know, don't get bogged down with some social justice issue or some other issue that uh, becomes so obsessive that you disengage from reality. I mean, it's okay to get involved in those things, I guess, but you can become so extreme, you can become so involved that you, yeah, you just kind of lose touch with, uh, you know, well, your heads are in the cloud, your feet are not on the earth, you're out floating around somewhere. Uh, figuratively speaking, obviously, but uh, yeah, we, we tend to be altruistic. We tend to have tremendous empathy, effective empathy, not um, cognitive empathy. We're actually uh, really light on that when it comes to understanding body language, whatever, and yeah, not so much. So that all translates into being sensitive. So uh, we are very sensitive to the needs and the hurts, particularly of other people, and particularly among that group, another subset or those who have experienced or are experiencing what we have experienced because we know what they're going through. So if you see somebody, particularly a child or whatever, who is being, uh, you know, the bottom one of the pecking order, so to speak, is being rejected by his or her peers, yeah, your heart goes out to those people. Now, here's where this gets into trouble, uh, causes us problems, gets us into trouble. Pathological altruism, pathological empathy is, yeah, we're sensitive to others, but we're also sensitive to ourselves because we do have this sense of uh, ethics. We do have the sense of ideals, the way that people should be, but unfortunately, people are not the way they should be. And because of that, they uh, abuse us, particularly psychopaths, uh, particularly uh, narcissists. They will take advantage of us because they see us as, as uh, naive and gullible which, yeah, we think we kind of are not even gullible. So they take advantage of us, and we become hypersensitive not only to other people, but we're hypersensitive, hypersensitive to when people slight us. No, nah, they shouldn't do that, but they do. That's part of it. And uh, is it wrong to be hypersensitive? Well, I think nature has embedded that in our hearts and our minds so that we, yeah, we, we feel the pain because, well, why do we feel pain? Why has nature put us together in such a way that we feel pain so we don't touch it, right? So when you were little, uh, we had, in our house, we had electric iron in our house, and you learned very quickly you don't touch the bottom of the iron because it hurts. So, you know, you try it once, you don't do it again. You learn there's things about the stove. We had one of those stoves, you know, with a burner on it, put things on the gas stove, and, you know, cook it. But when the stove's hot, you don't touch it because it burns. So you learn to associate pain with danger. So we become sensitive, so we have this emotional pain, and that alerts us to danger. That when you're around this person or people who behave this way, that uh, they're going to hurt you. So I don't know that it's necessarily wrong to be hypersensitive when people slight you or hurt you. Uh, people who are... Um, I hate to use the word normal, but who are neurotypical, they don't feel the pain because they are not rejected in the same way that we are. So they will look at us and they'll say, eh, you're holding a grudge. Is that a bad thing? I mean, if someone is toxic, yeah, I, I don't want to be around that person. You know, if a person is uh, has rabies, I don't want to be around that person. You know, I mean, maybe, you know, 
I'll be in the next block over, whatever, get me a mile away, or, you know, connect with my phone or whatever. But if a dog has rabies or some other critter, you don't say, well, I don't want to hold a grudge, you know. I don't want to be around them. And when people are toxic because of their behavior, hypersensitive, yeah, too sensitive. Well, from the perspective of a person who is um, neurotypical, I could understand because they don't have the point of reference. They have occasions where they are uh, slighted or offended, but it's not something that happens to them routinely, like on a daily basis. So... I can understand why they would not understand, but still, say it's holding a grudge, I say, yeah, that's probably a good thing, because it protects you. You don't touch the hot iron. You stay away from danger. Number three is, um, I call this being not two different people, and I talked about this in another video maybe a month or two ago, but I call it conjoined personality. I want you to imagine somebody these two people, and they are conjoined. I mean, in the womb, the, they didn't separate. Part of them did, part of them didn't, so they spend their entire lives being physically connected to each other. But they're two distinct persons. So that's the way sometimes I feel my personality is. It's like there's two distinct personalities, but then we're one. You know, not quite conjoined, but almost conjoined. I don't have different names. I don't write myself notes. I think I did that one time just to uh, encourage myself. But there are times when uh, uh, we are confident because we get away from the pressure that pulls us down. That we're, we're confident and we're very centered and we've got our mind thinking clearly and uh, in a very linear state, very organized state, I should say. That is one personality, but then there's that other personality when you get around people and suddenly just almost uh, like somebody pulled a plug, you're a different person. Suddenly you are inhibited, you're intimidated, you feel uh, withdrawn, you don't feel comfortable at all. Well, what happened to that other person? Well, he's still there or she's still there if you're a female. You know, that other person is still there, you're still conjoined. But uh, would you get over here? You know, that's what you're saying to your thinking to that other person. I could use you right now, but nowhere to be found. But even though that person is conjoined. So it's not like in the sense of two conjoined people who are both conscious at the same time, but it's like conjoined people where one of them is conscious now and the other one is conscious later. Not necessarily disassociative, but uh, somewhere in between. So that is what it's like to have autism number four is uh, we live in a world of aliens. And this uh, occurred to me, I mean, not literally, this occurred to me because we are often accused, people with Asperger's syndrome are often accused of being akin to space aliens. Uh, or they will say, you know, it's kind of like, you are you on drugs or something? What's wrong with you? Because we are that different. Well, if we are different from them, they are different from us. If we are a mile away from somebody, they are a mile away from us. So if we are a space alien to them, then they are space aliens to us. Speaking of neurotypical people, so in that sense, we live in a world of space aliens. and But they see us as aliens, you know? Uh, when I was in China a few years ago, they had a term for Americans. They didn't call us Americans. They called us foreigners because we were foreigners. You know, they could look at us and see that we were very different. How they knew we were Americans and not Europeans, I don't know. They just assumed it before they even spoke to us, But uh, which they didn't do very often because very few of them spoke English, at least where I was. So I was in a foreign country. Now, imagine always being in China. And you never learn the language. You never learn the customs. You're just there. And you can't learn the language. You can't learn the customs. You're just in a different world, and you feel that. You're sensitive to that all the time. So when we say aliens, let's think foreigners. Foreign to us. But we're foreign to them. You just never feel comfortable until you get home and you're by yourself. But still, you're always aware that outside those four walls are all these foreigners, all these aliens. Foreign to us, alien to, to us. We can't speak their language. We don't understand their customs. We see they have them. We see they're doing really well with each other. We just can't participate. 
just can't do it. I mean, we try, we do our best, but we just can't. That is what it's like to have Asperger's, to be uh, autistic. We live in a world of foreigners. We live in a world of aliens who just, quite frankly, we don't understand them. They don't understand us. And they think there's something different about us. Many of them think there's something wrong with us. Number um, five is, I just thought I'd talk about this because we haven't talked about it in a while, but annoying fabrics. When I was a kid, you know, I mentioned this in another video a long while back, and uh, Sunday morning, Mom would dress me up in this uh, white shirt, dress pants, and uh, felt like they were lined with sandpaper, the most uncomfortable thing in the world. But what was weird about this was uh, to put on, we called them slacks, dress pants, but uh, I had to put on my socks before I put on my pants. And it wasn't just dress pants, it was any pants. Because just the feeling of the cuff of the pants rubbing on my ankle was just really annoying. That seemed so weird. Now, I didn't realize that it was something that was unique to me, and a few people liked me. I just assumed that everybody felt that way. Apparently, they don't. Another thing that follows those uh, that, that line of thought is uh, I hate haircuts. Uh, remember, I talked about this in another video, but the one thing I always hated as a kid was getting a haircut because, not that I mind, uh, not that I minded my hair being cut, but I didn't like getting those little clippings all over my shoulder. So you go to the barber. Usually, my dad cut my hair, but you go to the barber, whatever, and they put this um, cloth around you and they pull it in really tight and they pin it so you won't get any hair on you. It doesn't work. I mean, you know, it keeps most of the hair off, but there's enough that gets in through, I don't know how it does it, but there's enough of it that gets past that cloth that it just itches. I mean, it is miserable, at least to me. But, uh, you know, I'd see other people getting haircuts that didn't bother them. It doesn't occur to me that uh, I was different. I just wondered why it didn't bother them the way that it bothered me. I thought that was kind of strange. But uh, I didn't like to take a bath when I was a kid. It had nothing to do with autism. I just didn't like to take baths. But any time I got my hair cut, I headed right to the bathtub. Had absolutely positively had to get that off of me. So I went to something that um, I really hated to do, take a bath, so I could release something that I hated even more, and that was that hypersensitivity to the feeling of hair on my shoulders. Same thing as the feeling of uh, fabric on my ankles. That seems to be typical of a lot of people with autism. Number six is just feeling out of place, being made to feel out of place. When you are around people, you feel like you should not be there. You know that you're supposed to be there. You go to school, you know, yeah, you're supposed, well, you have to be there. You don't have a choice. But when it comes to that social element, which you cannot escape, you just feel like, man, I'm just out of place. It's, it's kind of like you got to sit, you know, say you go to the store, you buy a dozen eggs, and you open up the uh, carton, and there are 11 eggs and one, uh, I don't know, uh, grape. So uh, you are the grape, you know, this is supposed to be a dozen eggs. You're not an egg, you're a grape. You know, or maybe you buy a dozen grapes and one of them's an egg, whatever. But you're made to feel out of place because people don't accept you. They, they sense that weirdness, that foreignness, that alienness, that creepiness, you know. And so they avoid you and because, well, they avoid you because you are a social deficit. If they befriend you, but everyone knows you're weird, so to befriend you is to become weird like you. So you are a deficit. People like to hang out with popular kids, you know, in school, particularly junior high, maybe high school. And you're just the opposite. You're on the other end of the spectrum. And they make sure you know it. You know, sometimes they don't have to even say anything. Just by virtue of the fact they don't have anything to do with you, the message is uh, loud and clear. I just feel out of place. You know, I remember uh, when I was, I don't know, maybe 11, 12 years old, 
and I told this story before a couple months ago, but uh, we were in church, and the church was packed with, uh, I don't know, several hundred people, and they were singing the open song. I don't remember. They always sang the same song at the beginning. Uh, not really lit liturgical, but it was just uh, tradition. And uh, the song was coming to an end, and everybody was standing and singing. And I had nowhere to go. I was standing in the aisle to the right side of the church, and nobody wanted to sit with me or wanted me to sit with them because I was a social liability. So now nah, you go sit somewhere else. Uh, it was just kind of terrifying because I knew that song was coming to an end, and as soon as it came to an end, everybody's going to sit down. And I'd be left there standing, look like an idiot. I look like an idiot, anyhow. But, you know, uh, people say, what? Sit down, stupid. You know, what's wrong with you? Well, there was nowhere to sit. Finally, I managed to convince my brother, who's five years older, to allow me to sit with him. And he said, nah, go sit with your friends. I don't have any friends. You know, there's no one that I can I can sit with. And finally, he, I guess he saw it in my face or whatever. So finally, he let me sit with him. And I escaped the embarrassment. But that's what it's like to be autistic. You're made to feel out of place. Number seven is you are misunderstood. And when I talk about this, I like to call it misdiagnosed because in a very real sense, when people see your weird behavior, they need an explanation. There's something about the human psyche that we need to explain everything. It's kind of like uh, you ever lose your cell phone or maybe your wallet or your keys and you wonder where to go. I mean, you got to have an explanation. Sometimes we think somebody must have stolen them, you know, and we convince ourselves, you know, who stole my cell phone? Then you find it, then you feel kind of silly because you thought someone stole it. But we need an explanation. And so when people see people with uh, autism, when neurotypical people observe people with autism, what they are observing is something that, uh, something that is missing. And they need some explanation. So they just make up something. You know, they'll say we're aloof or they say we... Um, that we are arrogant or they say that we are not um what what's the word that i'm looking for that we don't uh well that we're lazy i guess best way to say it or there's some other deficit that we have some character flaw i think that's what i was trying to say but that's not that's the wrong diagnosis you know the problem is we're autistic and we don't know how this thing works uh, you can explain it to us if you want but we still can't do it because of mind blindness. So they diagnose us. And the diagnosis is always wrong. I think I was 64, 65 years old before somebody gave me a correct diagnosis. That's when I went to see a therapist. But before then, people would, uh, you know, they sometimes they get flat out mad at you because you would not march in their band, march in their parade the way you were supposed to march. Felt like Gomer Pyle. You remember that? Uh, couldn't march in the parade. People say, man, this guy, what is wrong with him? Well, you don't know. You don't know how to do it. You know, and you can't learn how to do it. You can mask, you can pretend, but still it's kind of obvious that there's something off about this guy. So people will misunderstand us. They will misdiagnose us. And uh, as I'm thinking through the years, uh, kind of reminiscing, the, the diagnosis that they would give me, and if you are autistic, you can let me know if you experience the same thing. It was always negative. They never said, oh, this guy's a genius. Nobody ever said that. The reason his problem is he has some superior uh, social skills, and so he can't fit in. Nobody said that. You know, they always said, eh, he's got a problem. The diagnosis was always something bad. I guess they do that because it makes him feel better. Or maybe they're thinking if they behave that way, it would be because they were lazy or because they were aloof or for some other reason, because they lack character, you know. Number um, eight is this. We have this thing, or at least I have this thing. I don't know if it's true of everybody or not, but I have this obsession with completing task um, before I do something else. Years ago, I knew an elderly woman who attended the church that I attended, and I was talking to her son, who's an adult, 
here's what was frustrated. I mean, here's to the point of tears. And I just, what's, what's wrong with you? And he explained to me that his mom would not eat supper, older woman. And the reason she would not eat supper is because she had not completed lunch. You know, 7 o'clock at night, time to eat supper, but she still had this little bit of a sandwich that she was eating at lunch, and she couldn't start dinner, supper, whatever you want to call it, until she finished lunch. I, I seem to have that, maybe not that extreme, but I like to finish a project before I start another project. Now, is that an Aspie thing? I don't know. Is that an ultra... Um, Autistic thing, I'm really not sure if it is or not. It's just a thing that I thought of, and I thought, you know, I think I'll throw this one in. So if you look on your screen, what you will see are two rectangles. And if you want our conversation to continue, all you got to do is click one of those two rectangles, and we keep hanging out together as long as you want. But if not, thanks for stopping by, and we will see you all next time.